All right, and uh, I'm going to move over to Zencaster. Start the recording. So Celine, gardens are basically a real life growth strategy. Why is that? Uh, well, I, I was, it's funny because we had the title there. I like how gardening and marketing are basically the same thing. And I was you're like, well, hey, one produces fruit and one produces like leads or improved like customer experience or whatever. And I was like Money. about to fight how they're totally different. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, <laughs> but uh, basically, like we, you know, both of us are obviously huge gardening fanatics and huge marketing fanatics. And I know we've, we've talked about this so many times before, um, but never really got around to like formalizing it or producing any content around it. But gardens, gardening and marketing actually have so much in common. Um, for starters, they're cyclical and iterative. Um, you know, each and each, they, they go through these cycles, right? Like a garden goes through, you know, usually it's on an annual cycle. Um, but there's also kind of the micro cycles within it. But each time a cycle cycle repeats, there's there's always that opportunity to change the circumstances and therefore the results to figure out what went wrong or what wasn't quite perfect and fix it or what was really awesome and harness that for other crops. Um, you know, they, they both take time and consistent effort and energy uh, that you have to put into them. You know, they don't just happen magically. I mean, some people maybe think gardening is like, oh, just plant the seed in the ground, it'll grow, Matt, and it's done. Um, that's not true. Um, <laughs> as long as you take action, you'll get results. Uh, even if you're not an expert um, at either gardening or marketing, as long as you do something, you're going you're gonna to get something. Um, of course, there's always tons of room to observe and learn and improve, but the strength and the speed of your results depend on as much on the, or depend as much on the strategy as on the nature of the elements you're using. Um, and then finally, we we take harvest from them. Um, obviously, gardening is a pretty obvious harvest of you know like vegetables, flowers, plant, you know herbs, whatever it may be. Uh, sometimes just pleasure. Maybe if it's like a, veg, a fruit flower garden, we don't harvest anything. Um, but it's just, you know, you're, you're harvesting pleasure uh, and marketing, you know, same thing. Like you're getting, you're getting traffic, you're getting leads, you're getting conversions, you're getting repeat sales, whatever it may be. And this is important. Um, the goal of the harvest helps us understand which elements to nurture uh, most to craft an effective strategy. Yeah, absolutely. And these are all things that we're going to be diving into quite a bit more uh, over the course of the next, you know, half hour, 45 minutes or so. Um, and uh, each one of these things, we're going to talk about uh, more details, not just why gardens are like marketing and vice versa, but how you can leverage an understanding of how gardens work and of basic gardening principles to improve your marketing process and improve your results. Right? As Celine said, as long as you're doing something, you're going to get something in return. But how much you're getting in return, right? How fast you're getting things in return. Uh, you can affect these quite a bit. I mean, to some degree, you're going to be limited as we were chatting about, you know, you can't just like plant carrots and then have fully grown ready to eat carrots in a week. But you can affect how many things you're planting at a time, what sort of harvest you're getting, and you can speed things up by including different things. So anyway, we're going to talk about some of the elements that are under your control that you can apply in a marketing context and framework in order to thrive and get more of what you're already doing, uh, get more of what you want with the work that you're already doing. So Celine, why don't you start us off? Um, well, the, you, I'm going to start us off at the very beginning. Strategy. You need to plan ahead. Um, I'm just assuming that everyone who's listening to this has at least some basic knowledge of gardening. If you don't, maybe you're just going to be like mesmerized and amazed by this. But I'm just going to talk as if people know at least a little bit about gardening. Um, but basically, if you just start like sowing seeds and dumping in plants haphazardly, you're going to end up with a messy, unproductive jungle. Um, you know, whether that just be because you planted stuff too close together or you planted stuff too far apart and it's not as uh, efficient and productive as it could be, or maybe some of the plants are together, don't like each other, you know, like there's so many reasons, but if you just dump everything in and assume it's going to grow, it's, it's not going to work. You need to start with a good foundation. Um, so in gardening, that's, you know, that's your soil, your fertilizer, the layout of your garden. Uh, you know, you, you need to plan a garden. You can't just be like, oh, I'm popping a seed in and expecting a really good result. 
Uh, in marketing, it's the same kind of thing. It's your content strategy or your brand strategy. It's whatever your foundation strategy is, um, which we, we talked about in, I don't know how many episodes that was, a lot of episodes ago at the beginning of April, um, where we talked about a first growth strategy episode and the difference between a foundation and a growth strategy. So you need that foundational strategy. Um, then when, once you have that plan or that once you have that foundation, you need to plan where everything needs to go and when, um, in gardening, like you, you have to think about things like light, what hits light, when shady areas, sunny areas, what plants grow well together, time of year to start, uh, in a Facebook group, I just saw a lady post, uh, that she put her tomato seeds in the ground and was wondering how long it, they'd take to sprout. And, um, everyone's like, it's way too cold. Your tomato seeds need to be planted like indoors under light with heat. Uh, you know, you need to plan these things, right? Uh, so that they all work well together. If you plan really well, sometimes you can get multiple harvests out of the same space in one growing season. Uh, in marketing, it's the same thing, right? You need to plan like what channels you're going to use. Is it going to be, you know, Facebook, Facebook ads, Google, YouTube, what, you know, whatever channels there are and also how they interact with each other. Are there funnels? Do you, you know, are you cross promoting your blog on your Facebook? And oh, you actually have to think about these things before you jump in and start doing them. I mean, you don't have to, but you should. Otherwise you'll end up with a messy and productive jungle of a marketing plan. Um, <laughs> Um, and then once you have a good idea of where, what things you're doing, where they're going to go and when, then that's when you can finally get to work implementing. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, it sounds weird, but you don't actually grow the plants directly. Uh, you know, like they, they pretty much grow themselves. You don't look at it and you say, okay, you grow now. And every day you like add an inch or something like that. Uh, they are the ones actually doing the work they're going to grow. And if you live somewhere like we live uh, on the West Coast where uh, it's basically a temperate rainforest and we just have massive amounts of things growing all the time, uh, you know, things grow themselves. <laughs> weeds grow themselves. You don't tell weeds, okay, come in and grow now. But you provide the environment for them and you have the power to produce the best environment possible for them to flourish with maximum results. Right. So that's what Selena's talking about when she's talking about, you know, needing a strategy, a foundation, a plan. Basically, what you want to do is you want to set up the right context for people. Great marketing. You're not forcing anyone to buy something. You're not trying to convince them that they need something. Right. Much in the same way, you're not telling that plant to grow. But we know what makes plants grow better. Basic components, food water, sun, the right positioning amongst their competition, right? It might be tempting to think, oh, well, plants need no competition at all. But in reality, there are a whole bunch of different plants that you can quite comfortably grow together. For example, tomatoes and basil. Uh, and basically, if the things you're working on occupy different niches within the environment and need different types of nutrients, they can totally coexist. So in the same way, there are basic components of an effective marketing strategy. A effective marketing strategy or campaign needs traffic, engagement, conversion, and retention to be successful. This has other elements, right? So traffic, as Celine mentioned, you're going to need to pick a traffic channel, right? What are the ways you're engaging with people? Different campaigns, much like different plants, have different rates of growth. They have different needs to mature successfully and give you a maximum harvest. So you need to be considering what resources you have available to put in, what resources you're willing to put in, and what sort of timeline and runway you have, right? Because you are creating the right environment to make sure that both the organization and their audience are getting the resources that they need to thrive. You're setting up the context, right? You're making sure that the company or nonprofit you're doing marketing for, including yourself, is getting the right exposure, the right positioning to harness the need and attention that already exists, right? We don't create the sun. Sometimes we might use a light for a period of time, right? Maybe if you're engaged in the most popular farming on the West Coast, you're doing it all indoors with lots of lights. Um, <laughs> but for the most part, it's really, really, really resource intensive to supply all of the light yourself. But the sun, oh, fancy that. You have an amazing source of light there. <laughs> and if you can harness the energy that already exists by planting, you know, shade-loving plants and shade areas, et cetera, uh, you can really, really maximize your effort and maximize the speed and minimize the resources you need to put in. 
That being said, for example, if you need to get things moving really, really fast and you have a lot of resources to put in, well, that's when you can maybe start your indoor grow of your own. And, uh, you know, just keep in mind that you might be able to do things outside of the right season, so to speak, but you're putting a lot of additional resources in it. And because you're in a crowded garden space, right? The marketing world has a lot of different things in it. It has a lot of different competition going on. So making sure that these key elements, you're aware of them and you have intention and strategy behind them is really critical for making sure that you're going to be successful, marketing or gardening. So true. I might be a better gardener than I'm a marketer because I definitely have my plants under a light indoors right now um, as I wait for there to be enough sun for them to go outside. But even that too, you know, there's different kind of like scales and context, right? Like I have a counter of my kitchen dedicated to setting up lights and plants versus like a huge commercial greenhouse is going to have like, you know, the, all of the huge halogen lights or whatever they are and the big commercial space. Uh, I don't know where I'm going with this thought. I was. I, I know where I... you're going with this thought, or at least I know where I'm going with your thought, which is to say that, right, the, the first investment to create that foundation work is bigger, right? Mm -hmm. Like right now you have been building on yourself for years. You've been building on your own activities for years. So you're like, oh, okay, I want to start some stuff inside. You already probably have access to most of what you need. You already have the grow lights. You already have the trays. You know, maybe you need new soil or new fertilizer to re-up your seed supply. But marketing, like gardening, is iterative. It builds on itself. So every time you do it, you have access to the resources that you had before, and you just need to top them up rather than start over. I just moved from a space that was a small cabin, had just very, very limited gardening opportunities, uh, and a neighbor who had some few key things I could borrow, right? Moving into a full house with full gardens and all this different stuff to, working, uh, to start working on, I have a much higher overhead and many more resources I need to put in at the beginning. So just be aware that when you're working on a marketing campaign, make sure you communicate to your clients and help them understand that it is totally normal to be investing more resources up front. Just do some thinking and make sure you're investing in the right resources that you'll be able to build on over and over again over time. Yes. And it can be so tempting to get a lot of like really fancy, expensive tools. I, every year I tell myself I'm going to get a greenhouse and every year I'm like, no, I don't need a greenhouse. It's going to cost more than like the extra gardening benefit I'm going to get. It's, you know, it's, it's a very big long-term investment. Um, and you know, in, in marketing, there's also like the greenhouses or the things that are big upfront costs that might actually not uh, get you where you need for the level you're at right now. Yeah, absolutely. And this is where the harvest, so to speak, really, really comes in handy. <laughs> because you're, just like with a marketing campaign, you're working backwards from the goal, right? Like you, Celine, when you're producing plants, uh, you know, when you're gardening, and, and let's just be clear that both Celine and I are food gardeners primarily. Uh, you know, we love to cook, we love to feed our families, and we love to plant things that we can eat or eat. So totally no shame if you are a flower gardener or something like that. But we are really like the harvest that we are getting, we are eating. And your goals for your harvest, Celine, are about, you know, supporting your family, having some stuff put away, uh, you know, also having an activity that you can focus on when you aren't at work. So those harvests, so to speak, require different inputs in the sense that last year you already had lots of food and you have a certain amount of energy you need to put in to process it and et cetera. And, you know, a greenhouse for somebody whose harvest goal is to eat a 12-year or a 12-month harvest, for example, to produce things every month of the year, to make sure they have fresh salad every day in the winter. If those are your harvest goals, then maybe the greenhouse would make more sense to invest in upfront, right? So it's not just about, oh, what resources you have, what you can expend. It's really about working backwards from your goal, from the harvest that you're looking for to make sure that your strategy and the resources you're purchasing are aligned with that. Yes, so true. And this is kind of off topic, but I have to tell you, because you're going to laugh at me so hard. <clears throat> I know you just said I'm a food gardener. And as you know, last year I put in that huge, long, like flower bed because my daughter, who is a two last year, she, she really wanted to grow flowers. So I put in a massive flower garden. It's already like turned into like now more of a food garden than a flower garden. It still has all the flowers, but now it has like a pear tree, an Asian pear tree, five or six blueberry bushes, rhubarb, 
sorrel, a gooseberry bush. I, I'm planting some orac in it, strawberries. It's, it's actually now more of a food garden than a flower garden. Um, but it's a pretty food garden at least. That's awesome. But once again, right, like as a food gardener, yeah. why did you choose to put in a flower garden other than, you know, and for those of you who are food gardeners, flowers do bring lots of beneficial insects and stuff. So don't totally hate on the flowers. Um, but uh, because your daughter wanted to enjoy it and that's important to you, right? Like that's a totally valid, <laughs> that's a totally valid goal. And now over time, you're like, okay, well, we can have the flowers and also can add all sorts of I didn't yummy. intend it. Uh, <laughs> my, my, my vegetable garden is a lot more planned and intentional than my flower garden. My flower garden is kind of the messy jungle. Um, but it's, it's, it's for fun. It's not like my main source of like food and produce and stuff. It's the thing I let myself play with. Um, but I digress. Um, yeah, like how, how else are gardening and marketing related? Uh, one thing, uh, that is super critical is you need to keep a close eye on things and monitor frequently. Uh, you know, like in a garden, you're going to get pests, you're going to get diseases. I'm already like thinking ahead and I'm ordering ladybugs to eat all my aphids and stuff. Um, and you know, some years, some crops just don't thrive for some reason, whether it be like weather or something else related. This happens in marketing too. Uh, you know, some channels or marketing activities might be doing great. Some might need some tweaking and some might totally suck. Um, you know, sometimes it is completely out of your control. Like I, you know, I mentioned weather, but it's important to catch issues early before they snowball into bigger problems. Oh yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and you know, and then once, you know, like you said, it's a cyclical, uh, iterative process. Once you like learn about these issues, like I said, I'm already anticipating aphids. So I'm already ordering ladybugs to eat the aphids before, because last year I had a huge aphid problem. And once it gets really bad, it's a lot harder to rein in than if you catch it early. Um, and sometimes you just need to let go completely on, on something if it like totally fails and focus on what is doing well. And this, you know, happens in marketing too. You might try a couple of different things. And, you know, for whatever reason, one thing just isn't working, you're not getting traction, you maybe you've IDSed it, but you have other priorities and something's doing amazing. It's okay to drop the thing, you know, temporarily or permanently that's not doing as well and put more energy into what is doing really well and focus on that. Yeah, not um, only is it okay, but I would say that's generally the path to success. It's not actually shoring up your weaknesses. Mm -hmm. It's leaning hard into your successes and figuring out ways to make them more successful. So true. And overall, it's just, it's really important to regularly keep an eye on and check your metrics so that you're aware of these things. So you know what is doing well and what isn't um, and readjusting your plan based on what is actually happening. You know, same thing in the gardening. You're, you're out there every day or multiple times a week, keeping an eye on stuff so that one day you don't just walk out into your marketing garden and be like, what happened here? Uh, <laughs> and have no idea what was going on. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and this is where, you know, we were talking about that chaotic jungle. Even if you've sown your seeds well and picked a good layout and you have a great foundation strategy, if you do not monitor frequently to make sure that you are on track, you can still end up with that chaotic jungle. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. In fact, I, I would say that's probably where you're going to end up because you need to be at the very least weeding things, right? And what is a weed? This is a question I love. Like, what is the definition of a weed. It is anything in your garden that you don't want to be there. <laughs> With generally because it's negatively impacting the other plants in there, right? Some weeds that we traditionally consider weeds like dandelions or chickweed or something like that are actually super edible, totally good for you and used to be like food staples in some areas and times, times and places. Uh, but at the same time, even if you have, uh, you know, like a beautiful, beautiful plant, uh, let's take the tomatoes or potatoes, for example. If you have a volunteer uh, tomato or potato come up or squash in an area that you don't intend, you might be like, oh, sweet. If that's in your compost pile, you're like, great, free food. My compost pile is giving me like squashes and tomatoes. But if that's in the middle of like your lettuce garden or something like that, that 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 crap is going to take over, <laughs> right? Like that that's just going to totally overwhelm the garden. You're not going to get any lettuce out of it. So yeah. it's not just about identifying what works and what don't, what doesn't. It's about monitoring regularly to make sure that the right pieces are in the right places and moving forward in the right ways. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, it's funny in gardening, I like don't have the heart to like pick or cut out any like food that accidentally was a volunteer 
Um, and so last year I ended up with half my lawn being covered in huge squash vine and that couldn't be mowed and it was a nightmare, but I got a lot of squash. Um, but it was probably the wrong thing to do like overall, but in marketing, I'm a lot more ruthless. I'm like, okay, this is off track. Like, you know, keep it, keep it going forward. But then again, also, you know, in marketing, there's, there's more riding on it. There's a business riding on it. Whereas gardening, it's, you know, it's not quite because my livelihood doesn't depend on it. Um, I, I let myself be a bit less rigid, maybe not as much as less rigid as most people are with gardening, but more less rigid than I am at work for sure. Well, we are definitely, and of course, uh, you know, your garden is far more mature and in a cool position than mine. Um, but, uh, you know, I think as super strategic people, it's like pretty impossible for me to approach gardening and not put that kind of strategic lens on it. Yeah. Well, you've yeah. seen my like six tab spreadsheet of my garden planner that also includes like a full seed inventory and perennial plant inventory and like a map of exactly what's planted when down to the square foot. Uh. Yep, I feel you. I used to have, uh, at the old place I used to live where I had large gardens, uh, I had a similar thing going on. Actually, I don't know if I've shown you, but uh, right now I've gone back to, as you know, I've gone back to analog for a lot of things. I've been on the bullet journal craze. Uh, and uh, one of the things I love about it is that you can like customize layouts for tracking data. And because we are so on about tracking data all the time uh, in, at Anansi and in our marketing work and stuff, and because I just moved into a place that has so many perennials, so many things that are already planted and so little garden space that I realize I just have to observe the data before I even dig into it. So I have all of these like cool customized layouts that track like the sunlight in different areas hour by hour and like what's in bloom and what har gets harvested every month. Um, and I always thought that would be way too overwhelming to do in an analog way and not a digital way. Uh, but uh, I've actually been loving it. It feels like a super low pressure fun thing. <laughs> this is what I do for fun in the evenings. I like draw myself layouts and like track sunlight and stuff. Uh, I know. In my Everyone's going to be laughing at us. We bring our same level of nerddom that we and, and love of processes uh, that we use at a Nancy into our personal lives so much. <laughs> But that's a really, you know, when they say, uh, I think there's a lot of rhetoric right now, um, actually pushing back against the like, do what you love movement in the sense that like, uh, as I understand it, what I've been hearing, uh, and, and these are from like people I respect, like influencers and thought leaders, is if we pick a thing that we love and are absolutely determined to be successful doing it, we may or may not achieve that level of success, so to speak. But if we identify the things that we feel fulfilled by, that excite us, that move us forward, or that we, you know, have to slog through in the different work and in the different tasks that we do, it'll often lead us on a journey kind of to places we may not expect in terms of our careers and our day to day, but it'll lead us on a path to fulfillment uh, because you can never fully understand all the things that fulfill you until you're in that kind of, well, surprise, surprise, cyclical process of observing and reflecting on data and making new choices based on it. <laughs> Shock. It's like a personal growth strategy. It's like instead of the growth strategy in your business, it's like personal growth strategy. Yeah. So uh, how else are gardens and marketing basically the same thing? Okay. So this is a perfect lead in uh, to this topic because in both our growth strategy process, right? So any kind of ongoing recurring growth-based marketing that is tracking metrics, right? We just sum it all up as growth strategy, which is our process. Results are never instant. They take time and nurturing. Now, we all hear about those amazing, amazing marketing stories where someone came up with like the perfect in-person engagement at a big trade show or something like that and just magically blew up and engaged 100,000 people and became a viral sensation overnight. And those are beautiful fairy tales. Uh, <laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong, that happens, but much in the same way, it's like the 30 year overnight success, right? We can often have periods of explosive growth but 
usually they're based on some sort of strong foundation and persistence and continual work. And if they're not, if you just go from zero and no plan and no strategy to overnight viral success, that's how you end up being like a cautionary tale a lot of the time. <laughs> to be, right? Like whether it's like a child actor or whether it's like a company that blew up super, super fast and didn't have time to kind of like catch its growth up to its popularity. Like just before this call, we were chatting about Zoom. Um, uh, who we have used the app Zoom for years and years and years. And as uh, most people in the digital world know, uh, at the beginning of the corona craze, uh, Zoom just exploded, right? Because you have all these people stuck at home needing to engage in a digital way. And Zoom became very popular very fast because they announced that they were going to uh, give their services for free to all K-12 schools. Uh, I think that was the, the kind of thing that launched them into viral explosiveness. And... To some degree, okay, this was like an overnight explosive success for them, but they had been working on their platform for many years and actually had been working on their UI and continual improvement and et cetera for many years. And Zoom is a great example because I think it's an example on both sides. And it's an example of a seeming overnight success that actually has been around for a while, has a strong reputation in the digital world and had the resource framework basically to be able to scale up because immediately we were like, oh crap, we're not going to be able to do any of our meetings because all of a sudden Zoom servers are going to be overloaded. Now, when they rose to the occasion, so to speak, and they had this overnight viral success, it was really great. All of a sudden, they are literally a household name on everyone's lips. And magically enough, they were able to scale up their framework, uh, or at the very least, we have been having minor issues in terms of uh, uh, you know, being able to connect and get speed and stuff instead of the major issues we were expecting. But now we're seeing an explosion of concerns around security, where for the most part, and, and I... I'm not intending to get into a discussion about, I, I know a lot of our listeners can be very technical minded and I, I don't want to get into a discussion about the security issues themselves, but basically these were things that were basic, that were pretty much a non-issue at the small size they had been. But once they blew up, it became a whole new set of issues to tackle. Now there's this whole counterculture and et cetera. And luckily, you know, I, I hope for Zoom's sake that they're now putting all of their resources into this because they were able to tackle the scaling up problem and et cetera. But basically what I'm trying to say is that there is no magic pill. There is no magical thing that you do or consume or apply or some magical algorithmic thing that turns you instantly into a successful company or organization. And the reason for that is because number one, success is multifaceted, complex, and sometimes confusing. <laughs> That's why the goal and the harvest work is so important because it's really important to identify and understand, you know, what you're working towards. You can understand success when you see it, but also you can navigate around things that might feel like success, but actually aren't getting you towards your goals and where you want to be right? Because you can move very fast in one direction only to find out that's not the direction you wanted to be in, right? You wanted to be moving in. So coming back to the gardening analogy, right? Whether you're outside weeding, watering, whether you're posting content regularly, marketing and a great successful garden, right? That delivers, and we're defining successful here as one that delivers a harvest, the harvest that you are looking for. So a marketing harvest or a gardening harvest does not happen overnight. Often it is an iterative process of layers on top of each other, of the work that you're doing and the authority that you're creating and the nurturing that you're getting, right? That creates this very strong system where once again, I'm defining strong as it makes you money because that's important, right? Or maybe if you're a nonprofit, you do generally still need to be making money, but also delivering a certain level of service for your client, whether that's a paid client or not but also something that you can walk away from and know how it's going to affect things. <laughs> Ideally, a strong system ultimately, and I believe this about gardening as well. Not everybody gardens this way, but I'm a permaculturalist to the bone. So uh, the, a lot of the gardens I set up, especially as someone, you know, uh, as I've been starting my business over the last, you know, five plus years, I've lived in a few different places, starting with a trailer, you know, and each place I basically had to start from scratch and start a new garden, knowing that I was only going to be there for maybe a couple years. I was going to have to leave it behind. Also knowing that I was working 60 hours a week, right? So the work that you're putting in 
can be intentional in the sense that the work that I put in there was quite often perennial gardens. Gardens where I was planting a whole bunch of different stuff that competes in the right way uh, or setting in slow drip systems. Basically stuff where even though you have to work on it every day or regularly, the amount of input I'm putting in is focused in specific areas. So I'm doing big pushes and then I can basically walk away and it gets stronger in that time. It gets better. It grows more. All I have to do is flip on, you know, the drip switch uh, for maybe an hour in the morning, an hour at night. Uh, and things are growing and things are happening, right? So what I define as a strong marketing system, just like a strong garden, there are inputs, right? Especially depending what you want to grow. If you want to grow uh, vegetables, especially sensitive vegetables, then you're going to need to put more work in, different work in. Uh, you might need to be there every day picking at some point, stuff like that. But I just invite you to challenge yourself to create a marketing system that you can walk away from to some degree, you know, uh, if you're doing, uh, let's say podcasts <laughs> or live streams or something like that, live stream is a bit more challenging, but podcasts, you can batch content, right? You can record more than one at once and then have a month or two months or heck a la Jason Swank, a year's worth of content ready to go. Uh, but you still have to put the work in, you know, you're, it's still going to have to be posted at some time. It's still going to have to be, uh, reworked from time to time. So, the growth as you go on can be so small and slow at the beginning, right? When you're just getting started, when you don't have any of this stuff, you don't have the layers, you don't have the rhythms, you don't have the iterations yet. When you're literally just starting out for a new client, even a big client who just hasn't done marketing stuff before, doesn't have their shit together. If you just sit and stare at it, you might not even notice anything happening. You're like, oh gosh, I put in this work. I don't see anything. But one day you look at it and you think back to the baby sizzlings, your initial marketing efforts and think, wow, you know, I've accomplished this incredible thing, right? Even if you just have literally planted seeds, you look at it and it's soil, it's dirt, it's soil, it's soil, it's soil. And then one day, boop, you have things poking through and you're like, oh my God, and you freak out and run around because it's super exciting. Or maybe that's just me. I, I love it's it. not just you. Okay, cool. <laughs> and you can end up with a massive plant, right? Like a squash, if anyone who's listening to us has ever grown squash or wondered where squash comes from, like you can literally have a squash seed in your compost pile produce like a hundred pounds of squash or something like that. I'm not, I, I'm actually not exaggerating, like a lot of squash. And that squash started from that same tiny little seedling. But squash is still gonna die and regrow every year, right? On the other hand, if your strategy, the harvest you want is apples or plums or something, you might have to plant a tree and wait five years for that harvest to start coming in, right? So your marketing activities, it's important to understand the kind of like scale and strength of what you're trying to accomplish, but also that when you're starting from scratch, it is going to be slow going at first right? Eventually it's like, oh my God, how did this happen right under my nose? Because you've just been gardening and working and working and now you have infinite amount of squash, <laughs> right? Uh, in a garden, we can see this. We can see it getting bigger, right? We can see your plants. You can identify, okay, that one has bugs on it. That one has brown spots on it. That one has powdery mildew. Uh, but in marketing, it's not always so obvious. In fact, you can get a lot of false positives. You can be like, great, things are happening. Sweet. You might not be sure what's happening, how fast it's happening, <laughs> how consistent it's happening, whether it's getting you to the results you want, but stuff's happening. And that's where metrics come in. If it feels like we are just beating this topic into the ground around metrics week after week in podcasts, uh, that's because it's that important. <laughs> it really, really is. Uh, and metrics are those visual cues in your garden, basically for your marketing. It can really help you see your progress. It can see how fast things are moving, whether they're moving fast enough. You can see whether you're getting enough traction at the front end to accomplish things uh, at the back end, right? There's, it gives you milestones to celebrate from that first seedling popping up to the first flowers, to the fruit, right? To new engagement, inbound leads, all the way through to cha-ching, the money in the bank is also a fun thing to celebrate. But sometimes you, you need to look at stuff ahead of that <laughs> in order, well, I would say always you need to look at stuff ahead of that in order to plan successfully. Anyway, oh, what I'm trying to say is that results aren't instant. They take time and nurturing. But if you're careful and intentional about what you're growing, 
And the type of work you're putting in, how you're putting your time in, how you're nurturing it, you can actually create results that continue to create themselves. Uh, and the inputs that are needed over time can be massive or minimal. And that's kind of up to you. It's up to you in terms of what you're trying to produce. It's up to you in terms of uh, what resources you have at your disposal. But most of all, it's up to you in terms of your plan, figuring out what you're going to plant, figuring out how you're going to batch your energy to maximize the work that you're doing, you know, creating content that can be posted to multiple different platforms, right? Doing research on your audience that can apply to multiple different types of marketing activities. There's lots of power here that you have over not just what grows, but how you grow your garden. So true. Oh my goodness. I'm, I'm so amped now on both marketing and gardening. I like want to go out into my garden and like work and do marketing. Uh <laughs> I do. I actually like kind of like to batch the two sometimes. So like listening to uh, marketing related like podcasts and audiobooks while I garden and just being like, ah, oh, keeping a notebook and then with like dirty hands, occasionally scribbling something down as it comes to me. <laughs> that is such uh, a safe thing to do. Yeah. I, I also with my like major ADHD brain, uh, I like to do multiple things at once. I know it's more efficient to do one thing at a time. Uh, but when I'm relaxing, uh, you know, if, if you're watching the video, you can see my strong finger quotations here. Uh, it usually means I'm relaxing my sense of focus and control. So I'm allowing myself to start like five or six projects at once and not get them done <laughs> while I'm cleaning the house or something. But Anyway, <laughs> as uh, we just wrap up here and uh, bring things to a close, basically, we'd like to leave you with a few questions of your own to ponder, right? Whether or not you're an experienced gardener, maybe you're, a, you know, an experienced marketer and you're thinking, well, heck, I'm going to try out some gardening now. This sounds fun. That could be cool, too. Uh, but basically, first question, what is it that you're sowing in the growing garden of your business, right? Like, what is it that you're putting in the ground? What are you spending your actions on day to day? Because guaranteed what you are spending your actions on day to day is what you are sowing, whether you like it or not. Do you know how long your seeds will take to bear fruit, right? Like, do you know what is, <laughs> what timeline you can expect? You know, what sort of harvest you can expect on the efforts that you're putting in? Do you know what resources you can add or shift or adjust to see whether that helps. And I will say this, when it comes to marketing, pick one resource at a time, right? If you're changing the water and the sun and the positioning all at the same time, it's kind of hard to track which one of those made the difference. Same thing with marketing, right? You want to make incremental changes, observe the results, more incremental changes, observe the results. And most of all, are there ways that you can shift your strategy or heck, create a strategy if you don't have one, hopefully you do, uh, to get a more bountiful, or speedier harvest. That's what I'd like to leave you with. And feel free to hit us up with your answers to these questions. We'd love to hear. Uh, or, you know, feel free to just reflect on them yourself in a journal. Bring them up at your next leadership team, right? Heck, <laughs> ask yourself this on the marketing projects you're working with on your client. You're working uh, on with your clients. Uh, and uh, just, just see where the answers can take you. Uh, and if you are a gardener, next time you're out in the garden, uh, it might be a good opportunity to ask yourself what sorts of things you've learned from gardening that you can apply. Hopefully we've given you some ideas to start off with now. <laughs> anyway, this has been another great session with you guys. Another great session with you, Celine. It's such a treat to be able to just basically ramble about gardening on a podcast. And get paid uh, for it. Yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> Anyway, to all of those listening, as always, I hope you have an amazing rest of your day. You know, if you're not having an amazing day, if you're feeling stressed, uh, feeling a little bit overwhelmed with the changing world and things going on in the world, I challenge you today to go outside for a few minutes. Whatever the weather is outside, go outside and just touch the outside world, literally, like with your bare skin. Touch a tree, touch some soil, touch some dirt. If you're in a warm place, go out in bare feet. Just spend a few minutes there. And I think there's a very strong chance that that will add just a little bit of extra brightness to your day. If not, you know, feel free to email me and yell at me or something. But <laughs> I feel pretty confident about this. The outside's a pretty wonderful place. All right, guys, take care. <laughs>